I was sitting in a cafe yesterday, drinking my cafe latte, listening to uh, Schopenhauer's The World is Will and Representation. I tend to not read books off a screen or a book in my hand these days. I tend to now um, listen to it the same way an ancient Greek philosopher would have. <laughs> uh, I listen to it on my MP3 player, an audiobook. Uh, Schopenhauer's stuff is widely available on YouTube here. Um, and, you know, the ancient Greek way of philosophizing was you went to a place where a professional rhapsode, a rhapsodist, would recite, say, I don't know, um, Seneca, or he would recite uh, Parmenides or something like this. And you would listen to that and you would discuss that among yourselves. So, in a sense, I'm kind of, <laughs> in not reading stuff, uh, listening to it, I'm kind of a little bit more in the actual philosophical tradition, or so I like to tell myself, <laughs> while I'm just actually loafing in a coffee shop thinking. Um, I like um, Schopenhauer's view of the will, um, or at least its place in the cosmos, or our cosmology. Our bodies are part of the universe, part of phenomenality. Um, but our will seems to inhabit individual human bodies. Now, Schopenhauer seems to agree with this. Uh, we don't know whether or not there are individual wills, or it's just a manifestation, a local manifestation of the overall will to life. Now, he just, as I say, he just baldly asserts that the will to life animates all of our activities, or all activities of life, or all activities of anything that seems to organically alter itself, or, or, or organically alter. He even said that the formation of crystals seems to be uh, some sort of will at play there. I don't know. Maybe. I don't, I don't know how we would actually test that to see if crystals or <laughs> fungi or something have a will. Um, but in any case, um, that I understand, the idea that there is a will behind things. And the way that he goes at it is, he says, we intuitively act with inside the confines of our own body. We are encased in this thing, a human body. Um, and this human body we can only deal with in a sort of a willing kind of way, an intuitive kind of way. I want to move my left pinky my left pinky is now moving. How did I do that? No, 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 not from the outside. Uh, you don't say the brain decides this and then shoots this message down, which causes the... No, 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 no. Let's say I, I'm communicating with a being that doesn't have a nervous system that works anything remotely close to mine. Let's say it's just a giant gelatinous thingy. And it wants to know this idea of manipulating in a precise way, parts of the of your own body. It wants to know how you do that. You're communicating with it, and it wants to know, how do you move your left finger, your left pinky? How do we do it? <laughs> Not scientifically explain it from the outside, mind you. How do you actually do it from the inside? Now, Schopenhauer deals with this. He says, there's the will. The will is acting on the human body. Um... It's when he gets to the why of it that I think he kind of loses the plot. He goes for a bald assertion, which is that it's the will to live. Now, I understand it was... I shouldn't really say it was a bald assertion, but he takes an educated guess and then treats it as a fact. I'll put it that way. An axiom becomes a fact in his world. He says it's the will to life. The will to exist and the will to reproduce. That's what animates everything. Maybe. Um, Schopenhauer arrived at this, you know, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, something similar seems to have happened in India, oh, about 2,300 years earlier, where we got what are loosely called life-denying philosophies, Jainism and, to a lesser extent, Buddhism. And this is a, not a true, a true characterization, by the way, of Jainism and Buddhism, but... On a continuum, these are fairly life-denying philosophies, or they can be. Um, 
Now that's 500 BC-ish, when Mahavira, Mahavira founded Jainism, although they say it wasn't him that did it, he was just the last one, uh, the last of the Jinas, and when the Buddha came along and taught his philosophy. Um, well, in India, about, I don't know, 500 years later, and it sort of peaked about a 500 years after that, in other words, a thousand years after the Buddha and Mahavira, Buddhism and Jainism, it was the movement which has come to us as Tantra, which says you can use your will. You can control your will. Now, this doesn't mean that, that, that your will is free. Um, it just means that you can channel that which wills. Schopenhauer kind of falls down when he says, in my opinion, he falls down when he says you can't will what you will. You can't decide what it is that you're going to want. I don't know about that. Um, that's kind of what occupied my thinking. And you ever, you ever get a thought stuck in your head while you're reading and you can read several pages without actually paying attention to what you're reading because your mind is actually somewhere else? Uh, that happens to me a lot. And I was listening to The World as Will and Representation and I kind of went off the map a bit there because I had this one of these fascinating synchronicities or serendipities when everything sort of clicked together in one place. Um, I'm trying to understand why Schopenhauer arrived at the conclusion that he did, and I think I understand that. I think I get it now. He said, or he arrived at a, at a fairly fascinating conclusion, uh, that it's all the will to live, and that colored everything else that came afterwards. Um... In the same way as, say, the Jains did. The Jains were big on the will to life. Um, and they said that the will to life is ultimately onerous, even horrific. Um, whereas the Tantrics said, well, there is the will to life, but that can be transcended if you don't identify with your own individual life. If you don't identify with your own, even your individual body. You simply want to put your body in the proper place in the cosmos so that you're mind, as it were, can roam free, I guess, inside of itself, and control of the human body, or at least an understanding of the will's place inside the human body, takes away that feeling of being imprisoned, takes that, um, takes away that feeling of being a slave to all these desires. Um, You have to use the body, as it were, to transcend the body. And it's interesting that Schopenhauer, of all people, who was called a Buddhist in his lifetime, which is such a misnomer, if you ask me, I would say he was an incomplete Buddhist. He sort of read a few things from Eastern philosophy, but didn't have nearly as much access to it all as we do today. And he, would, he didn't seem to know anything about the, I don't know what you'd call it, the life-affirming strands of Eastern thought, which has loosely come down to us as Tantra. Um, I did my crazy video explaining my Tantric philosophy or my Tantric practices, which just basically means swimming around inside of my own body in the first person, where I consider what it actually means to manipulate my entire body from the inside. How, if I'm speaking to that gelatinous alien, how I explain to it how I go from wanting to blink my eyes to the eyes blinking. How do we do that? <laughs> not from the outside. I'm not saying we don't explain it as a interesting second or third person phenomenon. I'm saying, how do I actually do what I do? How does the will assert itself? Um... Schopenhauer deals with that. And when he got into that, I went, wow, this is great. Um, maybe I've misread Schopenhauer all these years. And, um, but, again, he fell down. He just said, we know how we do it, but we only do it for stupid reasons. Is that so? <laughs> um, or empty reasons. That is perhaps an educated guess, but it's an educated guess that has become a fact. An axiom has become a fact, and he's forgotten that there might be other ways to look at the will. Um, the 
Buddhists and Jains. This is kind of a caricature, but they essentially say the idea is to extinguish the will. This can be done. I, I, I get it. I understand how that can be done. Um, the uh, Tantrics say no. The idea is to train the will. Now, this is not to say that there is a free will here. But it's questioning the idea that the will cannot will what it will will. <laughs> that we cannot choose that which we desire. Um, how would you prove that one way or another? How can you actually fiddle around with your own desires, your own will, and channel your desires? Um, how do I decide consciously that I want to get to know what's going on inside my own body from the inside, from the first person perspective, as though I'm that little alien inside the Cartesian theater in the movie uh, Men in Black, and I'm actually pulling all the levers to get my body to work. What training is required to get me, uh, or my will, to do that? And what does it mean to actually do that? What does it mean for me to go, I'm going to wiggle my left toe, from the thought to do that, the will, to it actually happening? What have I actually done on the inside? How do I explain to an alien, whose physiology is completely different from mine, um, what I've just done? Um, that isn't necessarily deciding what one will will, it's deciding what you will pay attention to. Because our wills aren't just one will, if you ask me. It's a gazillion wills. I think that the will to power and the will to life are compatible. Nietzsche thought so. He just had this hierarchy of wills, like Maslow. Um, and there are different wills. Now, we can't choose what will we will will, but it's becoming increasingly um, possible in my mind that we can pick and choose between wills. We can pick and choose between what wills we are going to follow in the multiplicity of wills inside the human entity. The, tantras, the Tantrics said, yes, the will to life cannot be denied. And we might as well admit to ourselves that the universe that we live in is not necessarily a nice place. Hence, the ferocity of gods and the terrifying images that tantrics, especially you know the Bengali or Tibetan tantrics, Nepali tantrics, are known for. These multi-armed, ferocious-looking gods with snarling, bloody fangs and things like that. That's a necessary element in grasping the fact that a lot of our wills are very onerous. There's no point in saying otherwise. To a certain extent, yes, there is nothing but, well, no, to a certain extent, life is dragging oneself through this, this existence, as Schopenhauer said. But there are other wills out there. There's the will, I guess, to ecstasy. Uh, the tantrics deal very frankly in this. We all know about the sexual element, which is actually a very small element. The main sort of ecstatic element in Tantra, if you ask me, is the Kundalini, where you have this ecstatic feeling that shoots up your spine and explodes above your head. Uh, that's not all there is to Tantra. Um, that's an ecstatic blast of knowledge and pleasure and joy and everything all at once. Um, there's other things. Uh, there's me on my bicycle going through the snow yesterday going, this is neat. I'm actually doing this. I'm actually bicycling in March in a cold climate, and I'm bloody enjoying it. I'm cold, but I don't mind because the feeling of being cold, which is an unpleasant experience, is balanced by this atavistic feeling of being open to reality. I have the choice to evaluate reality in a certain way at any given time, and I have a choice to accept or reject reality. I have a choice to like it, in other words, or lump it. Um, Schopenhauer seems to have chosen to lump it. Can you choose to like it? Again, that's why the 
tantrics always deal in these terrifying, ferocious images. That's reality for what it is. You have to understand that. But you can decide if you are going to like it or you're going to lump it. Um, I think that ultimately is what separates Schopenhauer from Nietzsche, at least in Western philosophy. Schopenhauer opted to lump it, I guess, and Nietzsche opted to like it. Tantra says there's a lot to lump in <laughs> uh, existence, but there's a lot to like, too. And as I say, it's fascinating to see these currents all sort of coalesce in one's mind when you're just sitting there listening to a book in a coffee shop and you get this sort of mini epiphany where all this comes together. Uh, where your thinking and some great philosopher's thinking just happen to coincide. And I suppose I'm not the first person to have actually thought, isn't it cool that I can actually move my own body in a way that I have no way of grasping how I'm doing it? Uh, again, not the actual mechanics of it all, but the actual manipulation, how my will engages itself to do all this. Schopenhauer has dealt with it. I just disagree with the conclusions that he's drawn. Or at least I say that his conclusions are incomplete. And I say it again, they lack courage. Schopenhauer strikes me as a fundamentally cautious, slightly cringing person, cringing back from life, saying, I don't know, that's a bit too strange. Kali is a little bit too ferocious and dirty and weird and unpredictable for me. Um, well, there are those who can say, oh yeah, I see her for what she is. There's a lot of beauty in there, too. And I'm going to engage my will in that direction, as Schopenhauer has engaged his will in the opposite direction, the denying um, direction. So we may not be able to will what we will, but we can choose between the multiplicity of wills, the multiplicity of things that we want. Um, we have a multiplicity of wills, as opposed to just one. And again, Nietzsche said it's the will to power. I think we have a lot more than that. We have a will to understanding. We have a will to meaning. We have a will to ecstasy. We have a will to all kinds of things. Um, the will to power and the will to life are one of many. And again, we have all of these. So we can't choose which one we're going to have, but we can choose which one we're going to engage 